As I said, our next speaker will be from the Coalition for the Homeless, and that's Shelley Nortz, Deputy Executive Director of Policy. Following Ms. Nortz, we will have a panel from the New York State Veterans Council. Welcome, thank you for joining us here today. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Shelley Nortz, and since 1987, I've had the privilege of representing the Coalition for the Homeless here in Albany, seeking funds to address the problem of homelessness and um, the root causes of it. The members and leaders of the New York State Assembly and Senate are to be commended for spending the last year focusing the entire state on the problem of homelessness and promoting the solution we all know works best, supportive housing. Assemblymember Hevesy and Senator Golden over the last year organized an unprecedented degree of support for, the, in their, for their letters to Governor Cuomo calling for 35,000 units of supportive housing for homeless New Yorkers statewide. Our elected officials from across the state turned out for rallies, forums, news conferences, public hearings, and other events to underscore the importance of gubernatorial leadership to provide the needed resources for this cost-effective housing solution. Supportive housing, as we have said time and again, solves homelessness, improves neighborhoods, and saves tax dollars. A two-year grassroots campaign bolstered by your enthusiastic support delivered big for homeless New Yorkers in this budget. Governor Cuomo has committed to building 20,000 units of supportive housing for homeless people over the next 15 years. These units, combined with the 15,000 supportive housing units for homeless individuals and families announced by Mayor de Blasio in November, bring us to the 35,000 units we've been fighting for, and now we need to make it real. We unequivocally support the state investments in capital, service, and operating expenses for the first 6,000 units of supportive housing for homeless individuals and families, which Governor Cuomo proposes to fully fund. We are most grateful to, both to Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio for seeing the need and addressing it, and we call on them to guarantee the future of their respective commitments by signing a fourth New York, New York agreement for 30,000 supportive housing units for homeless households in New York City. This will help ensure that the units are developed in a timely fashion and that investors and banks are confident in their lending for these projects. Further, we ask that the legislature add to this by appropriating additional funds to fully back the commitment of 20,000 state-funded units over 15 years for homeless New Yorkers. Governor Cuomo has provided a substantial down payment to fund 6,000 of the 20,000 units over the next seven years. These are all capital units, the first 1,200 of which will not be available for occupancy until 2018-2019. In the absence of a city-state agreement, we recommend that funds for all 20,000 units be appropriated this year and include 1,000 to 1,500 state-funded scatter site units in at least the first couple of years to help ease the crisis uh, in the shelter census in New York City and the rest of state. Further, the legislature should ensure that the operating and service rates are adequate for all models of supportive housing, past and future, to enable them to remain financially viable and programmatically effective, and that New York City receives at least 15,000 of the state-funded supportive housing units. We all stand ready to work together to make th this promise to homeless New Yorkers a reality, and we thank you all for your steadfast leadership. I'm going to t turn and just take a brief look at the situation of homelessness in New York City and discuss a, a few other budget-related matters. Um, more than 109,000 different homeless New Yorkers, including more than 42,000 children, slept in the New York City municipal shelter system last year and this constitutes more than 85% of the population in all of New York State in shelters. It's, it's about a 58% increase since 2011 when I came here to testify. And I think a, a, a picture speaks volumes. The chart accompanying my testimony shows that we really basically are where we were a year ago. Um, and part of the reason for that is that the investments from last year um, in the state budget actually haven't really borne any fruit yet. Um, for example, none of the J.P. Morgan settlement funds programmed for, to address homelessness via supportive housing in the current budget year were spent, nor has the city's plan for rent supplements related to the allocation of youth facilities reimbursement savings been approved by the state. 
Therefore, the two largest state budget initiatives to address homelessness in 2015-16 have not actually been made available to help homeless people move out of the shelters this year. Um, therefore, it's unsurprising that the shelter census is virtually unchanged from a year ago. And as we have previously warned, city investments alone are not going to get us where we need to be in terms of driving down the shelter census. Uh, therefore, additional state investment is required. As Assemblymember Hevesy mentioned, we're very pleased to see the continued funding of the $15 million for uh, the enhanced rent supplements that he initiated last year. We're, we're very pleased to support that. Uh, we support the provision of an additional million dollars in general funds for emergency homeless needs, but we also ask that the TANF line be restored for a million dollars as well, uh, as that references the groups with particular specified expertise and serves a different population than the, than the general fund. Um, and we ask that the legislature provide $1 million for the client advocacy program. Uh, uh, at one time, uh, it was annually funded by the legislature, but it has not been since, since the recession. Um, I'm going to just speak very briefly about the executive order and outreach and the, the homeless shelters. Um, first of all, the executive order created quite a bit of confusion in the initial days, but I think everybody's clear at this point that they don't have major changes to make in how they handle the needs of people who may be a danger to themselves or others. And I think the good thing that's come out of it is that some of the shelters have opened up their doors on cold nights. Some of the communities have been able to begin to see some resources from the state to help them in reaching out to homeless people that are staying outside and bringing them in. Um, we also welcome the governor's attention to uh, the conditions in shelters. Uh, we are the court appointed monitor for municipal shelters for adults in New York City. Also recently appointed to monitor the shelters for families in New York City by City Hall. And uh, we think more attention to shelter conditions is a good thing. Um, and it's frankly refreshing because there are large and we think dangerous shelters that have been left unregulated altogether by the state uh, uh, over our objections in the past. So we're, we, we welcome the state's added attention to shelter conditions. Um, we do not think that the state should be operating homeless shelters any more than we should. We are a regulator of shelters. We shouldn't be running them as well. Uh, the same, same view holds with respect to the state, but we think that the state should be sharing equally in the non-federal share of the costs of running shelters in New York City. Um, and in recent years, uh, the state has vastly shifted that cost onto the city taxpayers alone and has really cut back on the state investment in operating shelters, so that should be restored. Um, and we finally, as was referenced earlier, asked that the legislature reject the language in the safety net appropriation that would permit the state to withhold funds from New York City in order to re reimburse its own costs for operating shelters. Uh, there's no need for the state to, to fund it that way. If they want to put an appropriation in to pay themselves to run shelters and that's what they want to do, they can do that. Um, there's some additional budget items in here. I would, I would thank Senator Savino for mentioning the uh, sunset date on screen three because I think that's vitally important and, and one of my additional recommendations actually would suggest we expand to include families with a disabled family member who isn't uh, head of household, for example. So I thank you and I'll take any questions. Okay, Ms. Nords, this, first of all, thank you for your testimony. Um, I got, on a personal note, just gotta tell you, you, you and your organization are fantastic. Um, and Giselle and Mary, who's been leading the charge, the 35,000 units in the state of New York was an idea about nine months ago. With your strength and guidance, um, it has come to fruition. So I just wanna thank you and everybody else at the coalition. You guys are absolutely, absolutely great. Um, thank you've you. raised a number of uh, significant uh, issues um, with uh, Scattersight uh, being uh, spent up for the first year of uh, New York, New York 4, so we agree with you and think that uh, particularly in upstate, in, in the city as well, but in upstate, that's uh, something that is crucial. Um, I hear you about the two largest investments that we did last year not coming to, um, to actually get on the ground and start helping people in need, so uh, that's something that we will take up with the, uh, the executive. Um, and I will tell you, just on, on the last note, uh, the safety net appropriation language, yes, I, I have, uh, um, I'm pretty confident and it will be my recommendation that we reject that. Uh, there's no need to be punitive about that. Uh, but other than that, I just want to say an incredible thank you once again. Thank you so much. Well, I don't like you as much as he does, but. <laughs>
Yeah, I cornered the market on this one. But I've known you longer. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, I, I would I actually agree with um, Assembly Member Hevesy. So I'm still confused. I understand that the state is attempting to build the city via the safety net program for additional services for the homeless, unlike what they do with any other locality in the state. But do you have an, a sense of how much money this would be? I don't think they've made that determination yet. They, my understanding is that they've been scouting state-owned properties to convert to shelter use throughout New York City. I don't, haven't heard of them inspecting facilities outside the city, but they could be doing that as well. And not that they would charge the city under the safety net, they would just pay themselves out of the safety net budget line um, for the, the cost of the state operating the facilities, which I just think is a bad idea. If you're the regulator, you regulate and and you supervise what the localities are doing in either directly operating or subcontracting with not-for-profits to run shelters. But your understanding is the state would keep control of the operation of these new shelter sites or that is on the table. Uh, my understanding is that it hasn't that their decision making is in flux. It's a, it's a bit fluid about how they're going to proceed from what I understand, which is why I think there's not much detail and I haven't been able to get a briefing from DOB to get what their intentions are yet. And given the way the city of New York currently operates intake evaluation and location of where a homeless person would be directed, wouldn't that create a really complicated dual system in the city of New York? I agree with the question. I, I don't know how it would work mechanically um, uh, because, you know, and, and, and then there's another layer to it, which is for the single adults, they're, they're governed by the Callahan consent decree to, but to which both the city and state are a party, which would mean we actually would be also needing to inspect state operated shelters. So, um, so when the governor did his executive order about how localities should deal with street homeless, there was some back and forth and a lot of discussion, at least in the city of New York, about what we already do and that the city, even though I'd be the first to tell you they need to do more and they're not perfect, actually has a system in place. And they've made the commitment to dramatically expand the number of people on the homeless outreach teams and providing supplemental services. So my concern is more about what's happening in the rest of the state, because I've heard anecdotally stories of people being swept up and taken to emergency rooms and hospitals and left there. And I don't know a lot about upstate emergency rooms, but I'm going to take a wild guess that that's a really bad idea. And so I'm wondering whether that is simply anecdotal and not really happening, or whether you see this going on in counties. Uh, so I read the account of that happening in Saratoga, um, and I'm not surprised to hear it uh, because police often in upstate communities will transport homeless people, whether they're intoxicated or in psychiatric distress, to an emergency room. Um, but very often emergency rooms decline to admit, and um, I think what Saratoga Hospital said was, they did it, the, the reason they received these people was because of the cold weather and the fact that there wasn't another place to take them. Um, I, that has not been a pattern that I'm aware of. What has been happening is a lot of the upstate shelters have started putting mats on the floor to accommodate um, vastly more people than they're used to having, probably in violation of their licenses, and I guess because their licenses are not withstood by the executive order, maybe that's okay, but it does create risks. I mean, one of the shelters that we inspected years ago uh, at the invitation of a local sponsor had had a very deadly TB outbreak. And they were packing people in, you know, with just inches between their mats and beds and making the spread of communicable disease a very serious problem. So I think, you know, I'm glad to hear the counties are submitting plans. I'm hoping they're submitting plans that are adequate for the purpose of having sufficient shelter space that meets these standards. And so the inspection thing going hand in hand with the executive order may mean we actually have more adequate mm -hmm. shelter capacity everywhere. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay, that, that, that does it. Thank you, Ms. Nortz. Thank you. Uh, no, actually, we have oh, I'm sorry, Senator, Senator, then. Senator Diane Savino. Thank you, Senator Kruger. Shelley, nice to see you again. Uh, I, I want to ask you the question that I asked the uh, OTADA commissioner about the state intervention into the homeless system, because I'm still not quite sure what role they're going to play. Considering the city issues those contracts, the state doesn't, have they involved the Coalition for the Homeless in this because, as you stated, you are the court-appointed monitor of the shelters? They haven't. Um, we're not quite sure what they're thinking about. We are seeking clarification. I've requested a meeting to just to understand the basic parameters of what the mm -hmm. intentions are in the budget. Um, and I think we'll be uh, trying to meet with OTDA on the shelter inspection issue mm -hmm. just to make sure that we all understand what our respective roles are currently. Um, and because they haven't yet apparently decided exactly what they're going to do with these thousand additional shelter beds, I just think it's a little too early to know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm hopeful that what their decision is is that they make those spaces available to localities to do their usual process of contracting and, mm -hmm. and bringing in um, experienced providers. Mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, I think the not-for-profits do the best job from our 30 some odd years of monitoring shelters, the, the best run shelters are the smaller facilities that are run by not-for-profits. Yeah, I mean, certainly we, you know, we all welcome the state's um, assistance on dealing with the homeless crisis. And one of the reasons it became, I think, a, a, a new crisis is because we began to see more people on the street. You know, besides the fact that we have more people seeking shelter, we're seeing them on the street and they're becoming more noticeable. And one of the reasons for that, and I've never understood this, when I talk to shelter operators, you know, we have Project Hospitality on Staten Island, you know, t uh, Reverend Troy runs a wonderful program, but every day she is required by the DHS and the contract that she has to put people out in the morning. They're not allowed to stay in the shelter. They have to leave at 9 a.m. and they can't come back until later in the evening and many of them don't have anywhere to go when they wander around and they take their belongings with them. And I'm just wondering to the wisdom of a policy that says that people who are undomiciled, who don't have anywhere to go, are afraid to leave their belongings behind. Some of them are dealing with mental illness. What sense does it make to force them to sit out in the street all day long? It doesn't. And as a matter of fact, you know, 30 some odd years ago, I was running a shelter and it had that policy and we changed that policy because putting people out during the day if they don't have employment or education to attend mm -hmm. to um, is, is a recipe for serious problems and it doesn't enable you to work with them on problem solving, income issues, disability mm -hmm. issues, health issues, housing search, any of that. So I think it's not a good policy. I think that it's not true of all shelters in the state. There mm -hmm. are shelters where people are allowed to stay uh, through the day um, and then there are shelters that have that policy and I, I would say I'd be delighted to talk to Reverend Troya about trying mm -hmm. to uh, fix that problem. My suspicion is that some of the shelters where that's the policy is because they don't have sufficient community space. So those are the places Could that, be. for example, do things like eat, eat in the cafeteria in shifts because mm -hmm. they don't have enough seating for all the shelter residents to sit at one time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and again, it, it does elevate you know public awareness because now people think about the homeless population and they're looking for them and they see them, you know, and it just doesn't seem to make sense that you know you, you, they're out wandering around all day long. Um, and, and finally. Um, we, know, we don't have a commissioner of DHS in New York City, not yet. Um, I'm not sure what changes will be made with respect to that agency, if any. I know Steve Banks is kind of handling a lot of homeless policy, but I imagine at some point they're going to name a commissioner. But do, have you, has, has the Coalition for the Homeless and DHS and the state talked about, you know, how to begin this, what, they, what the governor rightly calls the continuum of care. Because as you know, homelessness is a multi-faceted you know, faceted problem. It's not just not having enough money to pay the rent for many of these families. So is there that discussion happening as well? So there's a discussion, for example, about the need for more safe haven beds that are the lower demand, smaller mm -hmm. um, shelters that can be very helpful to the population that stay on the streets because they're fearful of the larger congregate facilities. Mm -hmm. And I believe there will be increased capacity and I think maybe even the state's effort could, could assist with that. Um, uh, Commissioner Banks, I think, is very clear-headed about the fact that he's got kind of um, a system in flux right now. They've made a commitment to get out of the cluster site uh, shelter model, which mm -hmm. is, you know, where they take 
clusters of apartments in a regular right. apartment building and use them as temporary housing. They've made a pledge to get out of those 3,000 apartment units by, I believe, December of 2018. And um, that will be a housing resource once renovated, and they intend to make some resources available for that renovation that could be, for example, made available with rent rental assistance to be able to help people live in apartments that they can keep mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to having them in temporary. So I think there are aspects of the continuum coming together, and I think it's a work in progress. But I have uh, many, many years of experience working with Commissioner Banks, and I have a lot of confidence in his mm -hmm. ability to, to take this in the right direction. Me too. Thank, thank you, Shelley. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you. No, nope, thank you, Shelley. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Our next testifier is a panel of the New York State Veterans Council. Oops, sorry. Icon. Um, New York State Veterans Council, Bob Becker, Linda McKinnis, John Lewis, Kirby Hannon, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And OK, we're just going to ask you all if you can fit in with the five minutes between the four of you, OK? Given the fact that it is 20 to 3 and we are on testifiers number 7 out of, you don't even want to know. We, we, we timed it out, Senator. We, co yes. we come to 5 minutes and 15 seconds. So You can have the extra 15 <laughs> seconds. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Senators and members of the Assembly and the panel, this uh, consists of Thanks. veteran volunteers who greatly appreciate this opportunity. <coughs> we want to talk to you about the most pressing and challenging issues that we believe face the veteran today. Um, we're going to be brief because we want to leave time for your questions. Uh, we think your questions are just as important as what we have to say. Um, I'm Kirby Hannon. I'm legislative <laughs> coordinator for the VFW. Uh, with me is John Lewis, legislative chair of the VFW. Linda McKinnis, legislative coordinator for the Disabled American Veterans. And last but not least, Bob Becker, who is the legislative coordinator for the Veterans Council of New York State. And I'd like to point to our, our narrative or our testimony. Uh, and there's a memo on top of it, if you have it in front of you. Uh, the memo happens to deal with the VDP program, what we call the Vet Veterans Defense Program. Uh, and it's a, it's a budgetary request. But that's not the only thing we wanted to come and talk to you about today. Uh, so, uh, but what I, we really did want to do was have you understand Bob's counsel and, and the wide panoply of people that sent us here today uh, with their mission. And uh, so that's what we're here to do. John is going to talk about the importance of a continued emphasis on orientation for the returning vets of all wars. Linda and I will talk about, very briefly, about the efforts to fully fund service officers and peer-to-peer -peer program. And uh, we want to urge, or Linda would like to urge, Senate support for a federal initiative, the Federal Women's Veterans Access to Quality Care Act, to the extent that you can um, communicate with your uh, counterparts at the federal level. And then uh, Bob Becker, the critical nature of what is commonly known as the Veterans Buyback Bill, a huge message bill uh, for veterans uh, of, of all wars. And then finally, the groundswell of support for the Veterans Defense Program, which is the memo on top. So um, please, John. Uh, Very well. My name is John Pembroke Lewis, uh, and I'm here today representing the Veterans of Foreign Wars, Department of New York, as their state legislative co-chairman. Uh, I also uh, am a legislative uh, appointee to the New York State AIDS Advisory Council. I'm employed uh, with the Office of Emergency Management in the Recovery Division. Uh, I am a 22-year Navy veteran. As we are aware, uh, the United States has been at war for more than 15 years. Reorientation funding for our combat troops and sailors is on the decline. We have found many veterans with multi-tiered systemic problems. These include family problems, mental health problems, problems with the law, and problems with living their life. Veteran service organizations are dealing with this the best they can, but they need help. Veteran service organizations pride themselves in taking care of their own. We have discovered raising money privately simply is not enough. 
Various stress disorders are rampant and causing mounting fiscal implications. While service officers and peer-to-peer -peer mentors are available, many current and former service members are falling through the cracks. Many are finding problems with the law. I, pre I present to you, Madam Chair, two examples of why we need a Veterans Defense Program. The first example occurred here in Albany's federal court system. A married veteran with a very young autistic child served in both Iraq and Afghanistan. He was arrested and incarcerated. He was facing five years in a federal penitentiary for his crime. Representatives from the Veterans Defense Program engaged the court system, providing extenuating mitigating circumstances as evident in his service record, to which the federal judge ruled favorably, resulting in a fighting chance for this warrior to work towards becoming whole again. My second example, Madam Chair, a young veteran serving over 12 consecutive months in the Iraqi War Theater, engaged in two combat patrols each day, every day, came home and began self-medicating in order to cope with his experiences. He nearly lost his life in a motorcycle accident. The Albany County Court System, with the assistance of the Veterans Defense Program, uh, recognized the impact of his service and how it uh, played a role in his service and ruled with the Veterans Administration's assistance to give him a fighting chance. I am thrilled to convey to you today, both warriors are doing very well in their progress. Neither has reoffended, and both remain steadfast in working towards becoming whole again. Madam Chair, I strongly urge your support for the inclusion of $1.1 million in this year's budget for the Veterans Defense Program, the New York State Defenders Association, which will create the sustainability needed to defend those who defend America. Madam? Thank you. Linda McInnes and I uh, would like to create an awareness of the importance of service officers and the importance of the peer-to-peer -peer program, which I know the Senate is very familiar with, but we'd like to take a minute on it. Uh, and there's no better way to do that than by turning to Linda, who is both a service officer and a peer-to-peer -peer mentor. Linda, Thank you, please. Linda, for your service. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, again, like you said, my name is Linda McInnes. I am a two-time war um, combat veteran, woman veteran. Um, I also work with DAV also, so I'm a member and a legislative officer for the DAV uh, for Chapter 38 and for the whole state. Um, I thank you today for being here. Um, as far as the peer-to-peer -peer is concerned, I do that in, that in my community. I realize a lot of veterans um, have a hard time trying to deal with the VA system themselves. They don't want to go to the VA for services. They don't, they feel very, like, it's very clinical. And as a veteran myself, I, I understand that very well. So what I have done through the DAV and through them is also we set up peer-to-peer -peer, uh, programs. There are peer-to-peer -peer programs mostly through the VA and through other uh, mental health um, facilities. But unfortunately, people don't want to feel stigmatized and I think that's the biggest problem we're trying to break down that wall of stigmatization and the fact that you're a veteran it weighs even much more heavier on you so with that being said um, I have taken upon myself to be trained to be a peer-to-peer -peer specialist I am at this moment waiting for my full certification to not only deal with the mental illness, but to deal with the person as a, as a whole being, as whole. And that's what we want. We don't want the veteran to just be cured from whatever their illness is, but we also want them to be able to go through the rest of their lives, help their families also deal with the circumstances that we have. Um, we hope that you continue to support the peer-to-peer -peer programs, and not only that, make money available for myself and other organizations like the DAV, the VFW, and, and the American Legions who want to become peer-to-peer -peer specialists, that the money is there, that we can go ahead and get certified. We, we can continue to help our brothers and sisters, especially the ones that are on their way coming home right now or, and the ones that are here. They need our help, and, that, and that's the best thing. Um, as far as service officers are concerned, I also am a service officer, meaning that I go out to the neighborhoods or to the communities. I find resources for the people, whether it be finding um, information on the disabled American, I mean, I'm sorry, on the Department of Labor, 
um, whether it be something on human resources, whether it find food pantries, those are things that a lot of veterans are not aware of. So I go out and I find these resources. If I have to be an advocate and hold their hand and go to the VA hospital with them, I do that. I have, I, I'm, I'm very advocate in what I do. I will sit with them in the nurse's office. I will sit with them wherever they need to be. And that's what we need to do as veterans. And, and I'm hoping that through this, that you continue to fund these programs, you continue to, to fund to fund to fund the peer-to-peer -peer program, and also um, fund the service officers program. Because if I'm not out there in that community, then there's not going to be no one else to serve these veterans. And without myself and my other comrades being here, we are the frontline help to all of these veterans. Thank you.